Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. I ask unanimous consent that the following members be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing. Uh, Representative James Moylan, Moylan of Guam, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Without objection, so ordered. The Subcommittee on the Indo-Pacific of the House Foreign Affairs Committee will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the Chinese Communist Party's increasing aggression in the South China Sea. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Okay. Again, welcome to the Indo-Pacific Subcommittee hearing entitled Lasers and Water Cannons, Exposing the CCP's Harassment in the South China Sea. The South China Sea is an area of critical strategic importance for the United States and its allies and partners. It is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world with an estimated $5.3 trillion in annual trade flowing through its waters. The Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, China, and Taiwan all have territorial claims. The waters are rich with natural resources, including seafood and large reserves of natural gas and oil. The Chinese Communist Party has long maintained illegal claims in the South China Sea, spreading propaganda about its notorious nine, nine dash line, which is now 10 dashes because they added a dash around Taiwan. Across the South China Sea, China has illegally dredged nearly 3,200 acres of new land, some of which serve as military outposts that have runways for military aircraft and isolated research platforms that can port military-grade vessels. These artificial islands allow the CCP's Coast Guard to maintain a permanent presence in the exclusive economic zones of our allies and partners. Further, illegal and unregulated fishing activities destroying the environment and depleting fishing stocks. I led a bipartisan codel with representatives Andy Barr, Jonathan Jackson, Jasmine Crockett, last month to Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia so that we can assess the CCP's buildup in the South China Sea. Just a week before our trip, the CCP's Coast Guard used lasers to temporarily b uh, blind Philippine sailors and water cannons to stop Philippine Coast Guard ships from resupplying the Sierra Madre, a Philippine ship permanently stationed in the South China Sea to protect the Philippines' claims to the Spratly Islands. My delegation also flew on a mission with the U.S. Navy um, over the South China Sea, and we saw is congestion. Instead of open water, we saw civilian fishing fleets from South Asian countries, patrols from the Philippine Coast Guard, and vessels from the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy and CCP Coast Guard, by far the largest and the most common vessels in the seas, all vying for the same water between reefs and islets. When flying near the Sierra Madre post, the CCP Navy radioed into our aircraft asking who we were and demanding that our plane turn around, claiming that we were flying over the Chinese territorial waters. This was clearly a bullying tactic, intimidation tactic. Our partners in the region need our help and our allies are, are questioning if the U.S. will be there to help if the CCP escalates aggression in the South China Sea. We have willing partners and allies ready to hold firm against the CCP's aggression, but they need reassurances about the U.S.'s commitment to peace and security in the region. Just this month, for the first time ever, ASEAN countries held joint maritime patrols. The U.S. must encourage and support these activities in the South China Sea. Congress must take the CCP's aggression in the South China Sea seriously and ensure that our allied nations and are getting the assurances from the administration that they need. This starts with ensuring our military is supporting these countries' maritime domain awareness missions. The U.S. must also strengthen its economic relationships with countries in the region as the CCP seeks to use its economic influence as a means to achieve political goals. 
The administration's rhetoric about trade in the region has been positive, but has not been met with deliverables. Finally, the administration must stop sidelining Congress on its fruitless engagements with the CCP. A number of senior officials have met with the CCP in recent months, while the CCP continues to double down on militarizing the South China Sea and acting aggressively toward the U.S. allies and partners. For the U.S. to be taken seriously in the South China Sea, discussions with the CCP on this matter must be held from a position of strength. So I look forward to hearing the witnesses' testimonies, and I yield the balance of my time. And now the chair recognizes the ranking member, the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Berra, for your opening statements. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here and, you know, um, appreciate the importance of the, the recent uh, delegation that you led and, you know, unfortunately was not able to make it. But, you know, over the last several years have been able to visit each of those countries and, you know, share the, the concern about what we're seeing in the South China Sea and also share um, some of the issues that you raised in terms of what our strategy is, how we stand with our allies in, in, in the region. I want to applaud the Biden administration, actually, for early engagement, early two-by-two, two high-level meetings, um, not just in you know, the Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, but also within all the ASEAN countries. You know, the, the president's recent visit to the G20, followed by a stop in Vietnam, um, and you know, the, the announcement of what it really is a historic agreement, the, the comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam is exactly what we should be doing. And again, I think that that's incredibly important. You know, when I was in the Philippines um, just before the, the pandemic, it was a very different environment in terms of what the relationship was like with the United States under the, the prior administration. But I applaud the Biden administration's engagement with the Marcos administration, um, Secretary Austin's engagement and, and visits there, and the, the fact that we are going to be back um, in the Philippines. and with the harassment that the chairwoman has, has outlined in, in terms of you know, Filipino fishing vessels, Coast Guard, et cetera, the, the reiteration that you know, we do have a, an alliance with the Philippines, and if there is aggression a, against um, Filipino vessels, that the U.S. will uphold our mutual defense commitments to, to the Philippines in the face of an armed attack by the, the PRC. I think the president was very strong in his announcement. I think. That, you know, our, our friends and, and allies in the Philippines understand that this is an important strategic relationship. I also, you know, agree with, um, you know, as much as I wish we had gotten TPP across the finish line, you know, that's not where we are today. But the importance of economic engagement with the countries there, you see a lot of U.S. investment and support from the administration in, in terms of supply chain resiliency, redundancy, um, and, and the opportunities there. Um, Indonesia is a hugely important country. It's one of the largest democracies in the world, and I think this is also a place where, you know, having visited Indonesia, you know, understanding, um, you know, what's happening around the Tuna Islands and, and so forth this is another place where I think we can work in a, a bipartisan manner to support um, our friends there, um, as well as, um, you know, support the administration. Again, I don't think this should be a partisan issue. It should be a long-term strategy that um, we execute on, because the Chinese are playing a long game. You know, so it shouldn't matter whether there's a, a Democratic or Republican administration or Democratic or Republican majority in the House. I think this is a, an area where you know, I look forward to working with the, the chairwoman, um, and hopefully one day being chairman again. And then, <laughs> so, um, but, <laughs> but I, I, again, I think this is a place where you know, with my friends and colleagues on the subcommittee, but also across the, the full committee, um, there's great, um, you know, agreement on. And, you know, just one or two last comments. I'm really happy that the Coast Guard is here. And I think the Coast Guard will be critical in helping work with and build up the infrastructure. You know, when I was in Vietnam, we had those conversations, certainly in the Philippines, because the Coast Guard mission is not a military mission, but it's a law enforcement mission. And in that capacity as a law enforcement mission, um, it is about protecting the territorial integrity, the territorial sovereignty, the exclusive economic zones. You know, the Chinese operate in the gray zones, and 
working to help build up Coast Guard capacity, having our, our Coast Guard make uh, additional rotations through there, and then helping you know, the countries in that region build up their own uh, ability you know, and you know, providing maritime domain awareness, et cetera. I think those are all incredibly important strategies that I see the Biden administration executing, and I certainly think Congress should be very supportive in, in providing assets you know, and, and others as necessary. And again, I know in the comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam, you know, ho hopefully some of those will be forthcoming. So again, thank you for holding this incredibly important topic. You know, appreciate the, the prior hearing on the Indian Ocean region, which is also an area that we don't pay enough attention to and we ought to pay attention to so we don't find ourselves four years from now having these same issues there. So with that, I'll yield back and again, thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very important topic. Uh, let me introduce our witnesses. First, Ms. Lindsay Ford is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia at the Department of Defense. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Jung Park is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multilateral Affairs at the Department of State. Thank you for being with us. Vice Admiral Andrew Tiongsen is the Commander, Pacific Area of the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being you know, here, and uh, your full statements will be made part of the record, and I'll ask each of you to keep your spoken remarks to five minutes in order to allow time for member questions. So let me now recognize our first witness, Ms. Ford, for your opening statement. Well, Chairwoman Kim, Ranking Member, uh, Ranking member Barra, and distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come today and discuss how the Department of Defense is working with allies and partners to strengthen our common vision for peace and stability in the South China Sea. And I should say at the top, uh, thank you all as well for the time that you have taken to go visit the region to understand the challenges that our allies and partners are facing there. I will say in my engagements with them, I consistently hear that they not only want to see members of the executive branch, but knowing that they also have support from the legislative branch in the United States makes a huge difference. So thank you. Um, you have heard from leaders across the Department of Defense that our network of allies and partners is one of America's greatest strategic advantages and the center of gravity for the department's 2022 national defense strategy. As the NDS clearly states, close collaboration with our allies and partners is foundational to sustaining and strengthening deterrence in the Indo-Pacific region, including in the South China Sea. We cannot confront complex and interconnected challenges alone, and the South China Sea is no exception. Over the last decade, as you mentioned, the People's Republic of China has increased the scope, the scale, and the pace of its approach to assert control over the entirety of the South China Sea. They've constructed multiple military outposts on occupied and reclaimed features in the Spratly Islands and steadily equipped these outposts with an increasing array of advanced military capabilities. The PLA has sharply increased coercive and risky operational behavior in the air and at sea, threatening lawfully operating American, allied, and partner forces. This includes sinking Vietnamese fishing vessels, using military aircraft to harass Malaysian offshore energy exploration, flying within 20 feet of US military aircraft, and deploying water cannons and military-grade lasers to block and target Philippine resupply boats headed toward Second Thomas Shoal. Despite these attempts to assert further control of the South China Sea, there is another better vision, one that is shared by both the United States and the region. And over the past year, we've seen an unprecedented number of states enhance efforts to support rule of law in the South China Sea, which is a very encouraging development. As you saw earlier this week, the Philippine Coast Guard took a bold step in defending their own sovereignty by removing a floating barrier installed by the PRC Coast Guard near Scarborough Shoal. And in the face of PRC threats and intimidation, we've seen Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam continue to expand their offshore energy exploration efforts and challenge PRC encroachment. We've seen partners across Southeast Asia and beyond the region come together to condemn PRC behavior in the South China Sea, including in August, Australia, Japan, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the EU all protested the aggressive PRC maneuvers that we saw against the Philippines at Second Thomas Shoal, 
In the recent Camp David summit that President Biden convened with Japan and South Korea, all three nations strongly condemned the PRC's aggressive behavior in the South China Sea. And just days ago, members of the G7 opposed the PRC's militarization of the South China Sea and called on them to uphold the principles of the law of the sea. While our allies and partners have taken great steps to stand up for our shared vision, DOD is also taking an increasingly proactive approach to counter PRC coercion. A key element of this approach is building asymmetric advantages for our allies and partners. Since 2016, the department has allocated over $475 million in capabilities that enable Southeast Asian partners to sense, share, and contribute to regional maritime security. And we are laser focused on identifying new and cost effective emerging technologies that will bring greater capability to our allies and partners more quickly. Beyond the investments we're making in ally and partner capabilities, we have enhanced the complexity of our military operations in and around the South China Sea to ensure deterrence is strong. Earlier this year, the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group in the USS Ronald Reagan conducted multi-carrier, multi-domain operations in the South China Sea. And in June, Canada, France, and Japan all joined us for a large multinational exercise in the South China Sea. Just this past month, we are very proud to have conducted our first joint bilateral sale since 2016 with the Philippines, an important step in our alliance. We've expanded the scope, the scale of our annual exercises with partners, including Garuda Shield, which is one of the largest multinational exercises in the region, and Exercise Balakatan with the Philippines, which this year, for the first time, included high-end coastal defense, cyber defense elements, again, showing how we are strengthening and modernizing our relationship. We are diversifying U.S. force posture to remain prepared for any crisis or contingency. That includes regular rotational deployments of U.S. P-8s and littoral combat ships with Singapore, and in the Philippines recently agreeing to four new enhanced defense cooperation sites that U.S. forces will have access to. Finally, we are making a concerted effort to support multi- and minilateral coalitions of allies and partners, supporting networked security architecture of like-minded nations. In May, India and Singapore hosted their inaugural India ASEAN oh, Maritime kindly, uh, wrap up, please. Yes, Maritime Exercise in the South China Sea, and Australia and the Philippines also conducted their first exercise in the South China Sea as well. So let me thank you very much, say we remain clear-eyed about the challenges that we face, and we look forward to working with you on this problem. Thank you, Ms. Ford. I now recognize Dr. Park for your opening uh, five minutes uh, statement. Chair Kim, Ranking Member Barra, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the honor and the privilege of uh, speaking with you today uh, on, this, on the South China Sea. We have seen a clear and upward trend of PRC provocations in the South China Sea, including efforts to exercise its expansive and unlawful maritime claims. The PRC routinely harasses vessels lawfully operating in their respective EEZs and on their continental shelves. Further, the PRC uses intimidation, harassment, and unprofessional maneuvers at sea in areas where it has failed to put forth lawful maritime claims. For example, PRC aircraft have increasingly engaged in unsafe intercepts of U.S. and other military aircraft in international airspace over the South China Sea. The PRC likewise has interfered with our ally, the Philippines, exercise of high seas freedoms in conducting routine resupply missions of the Philippine Marines stationed aboard the BRP Sierra Madre at 2nd Thomas Shoal, a low tide elevation located on the Philippines' continental shelf and well within its exclusive economic zone. The world witnessed the PRC's dangerous and provocative conduct on August 5th when the China Coast Guard used water cannons and, along with PRC maritime militia vessels, employed unsafe blocking maneuvers against Philippine vessels. We saw similar behavior during later resupply missions on August 22nd and September 8th, and again most recently when the PRC reportedly installed a barrier to prevent Philippines fishing vessels from entering Scarborough Reef. We have made clear that we stand with our Philippine allies and have reaffirmed that an armed attack on the Philippines' public vessels, aircraft, and armed forces, including those of its Coast Guard in the South China Sea, would invoke the U.S. mutual defense commitments under Article 4 of the 1951 U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty. We have seen similarly dangerous PRC conduct against the Vietnamese fishing boat on August 28th that resulted in injuries to Vietnamese fishermen. 
An open and accessible South China Sea is vital not only to global peace and stability, but also to the global economy. Nearly one third of global trade runs through the South China Sea, worth about three trillion US dollars. We therefore have a strategic interest in upholding the rights of all countries to exercise freedom of navigation and overflight. Indeed, all nations have a vital interest in preserving the international law of the sea from maritime claims that do not comply with international law. In keeping with our longstanding policy on this vitally important waterway, we take a strong and principled position that all states, including those with competing claims to parts of the South China Sea, should comport their maritime claims with international law, as reflected in the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. The administration's approach to protecting this critical maritime domain falls into three key lines of effort. One, diplomatic outreach to promote respect for international law and the rules-based order, emphasizing the need for peaceful settlement of disputes. Two, maritime capacity building programs for the region's maritime law enforcement agencies and, and militaries. And three, finally, our own operations, including freedom of navigation operations and routine presence operations to demonstrate that all countries have the right to fly, sail, and operate anywhere that international law allows. First on diplomacy, we have consistently prioritized multilateral engagement through ASEAN and other dialogue mechanisms. And we have called on our ASEAN and other like-minded partners to call out the PRC's egregious behavior. Second, on capacity building, the U.S. government has provided over $1.6 billion in military and law enforcement assistance to Southeast Asian countries over the past five years, with a focus on building maritime capabilities and enhancing maritime domain awareness. Through the Quad-supported Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness, we are also enabling Southeast Asian nations to monitor their maritime areas and international sea lanes via low Earth orbit satellites that identify ships by their radio traffic and automated tracking systems. Lastly, we maintain a longstanding program to uphold freedom of the seas for all nations under international law. The United States conducts regular fawn ops in the South China Sea to demonstrate our commitment to these rights and our firm opposition to the PRCs and other claimants on lawful maritime claims. In summary, maintaining peace and stability and freedom of navigation and overlap flight in the South China Sea is part of our larger vision for a free and open Pacific. We will continue to work with you and we will continue to work with our allies and partners on this critical issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park. I now recognize Vice Admiral Tiong Sun for your opening statement. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Kim, Ranking Member, member Ibera, and uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am honored to appear before you today to discuss how the United States Coast Guard works to be a trusted partner throughout the Indo-Pacific. Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee, every day the Coast Guard, a key component of the Department of Homeland Security, provides a distinct value proposition, maritime governance. We protect, defend, and save those who live and work on the sea. We protect the sea itself, and we support the rule of law. At all times, a branch of the armed forces and a law enforcement agency, the Coast Guard protects, defends, and regulates more than 100,000 miles of U.S. coastline and inland waterways and 4.5 million square miles of exclusive economic zone. Our white ships with orange racing stripes demonstrate maritime governance wherever we sail. The Coast Guard's Pacific area encompasses 74 million square miles of ocean, more than half of the world's population and 77 countries. Throughout the region, the Coast Guard serves as a vital link between our nation's diplomatic and military options with unique expertise and authorities to support partner objectives. The Indo-Pacific is experiencing increasing challenges across the maritime domain. Malign actors exploit gaps in seams in maritime governance that generate destabilizing effects. For, for example, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing threatens global fish stocks, an existential issue for some Pacific Island nations as well as the world's protein security. Impacts to the global marine transportation system pose risk to trillions of dollars in economic activity. Also, 
the increasing frequency and magnitude of natural disasters combined with sea level rise endangers fragile economies and ecosystems. Chairwoman, I understand you recently returned from a trip to the Indo-Pacific region where you learned how malign actors exert influence, leveraging approaches to shift conditions to their advantage. Aggressive fishing practices and natural resource exploitation undermine territorial sovereignty and economic prosperity of Indo-Pacific countries. As a counter to these malign activities, the United States Coast Guard has been and is now operating and engaging throughout the region to promote maritime governance. We are trusted to support partners as they deter, disrupt, and defeat threats and challenges. In doing so, together we strengthen the rules-based international order. A robust network of partnerships is the cornerstone of a free, open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient maritime domain. Together, we bolster maritime governance through combined operations, sharing of best practices, and leveraging collective expertise. A key aspect of our approach in the region is to always meet partners where they are with what they need, always seeing threats and challenges through their eyes. These engagements may look like a small team deploying in support of a major oil spill or embedding members with partner nations to improve maritime domain awareness or even conducting operations with a partner nation's maritime forces. In coordination with the U.S. interagency, the Coast Guard has deployed maritime law enforcement training teams and national security cutters to support partners. Building regional interoperability and cooperation to uphold maritime governance. Chairwoman, the Coast Guard is well positioned to continue to work in the region to promote maritime governance, to contribute to efforts so that a rules-based international order is upheld throughout the Indo-Pacific. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for Congress's continued support for the Coast Guard. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, all of our witnesses. Now we'll go into the Q&A session from the members, and let me recognize myself first for five minutes. The CCP continues to ignore the 2016 Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling that its uh, nine-dash line has no legal basis and its artificial islands do not create its own exclusive economic zones, yet they continue to deploy the vessels to patrol the sea, intimidate our allies and partners, and swarm rifts. Uh, Dr. Park, Park, right? Uh, will the uh, CCP ever resolve their disputes in the South China Sea through a rule of law approach, which I think we know <laughs> what the answer may be, but you know, will they always resort to might makes right? Thank you, Chair Kim. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to uh, push back against and to make sure that our allies and partners are 100% are resilient to those challenges. Um, we continue to say out loud and to, to all who will hear and to grow that chorus of, of condemnation against the PRC's unlawful and expansive maritime claims that have no basis in international law. Um, and so we, we will continue to support our allies and partners. I will leave it up to the, the PRC um, to speak for themselves, but I think what our assessment is that the PRC sees this as a long game, mm -hmm. um, and they're using a variety of tactics across multiple domains, um, and that includes economic, it includes security, it includes just outright harassment and coercion through, through might, and we're, and we're looking to uh, tackle those issues in a multi-dimensional way. So considering the CCP isn't abiding by the 2016 ruling or Xi Jinping's 2015 commitment to President Obama not to militarize the South China Sea, what uh, prospects does that raise for a peaceful, orderly resolution of the disputed claims? Thank you. Um, one of the things that we're, we're working with our allies and partners on is globalizing the South China Sea issue. As you have mentioned um, here today and in other venues, um, that 
uh, that so much of the global economy runs through the South China Sea, and, and it's a vital economic throughway. Um, and so this is not just about China. This is not just about the, the countries in the region. It's vital for Europe. It's vital for us, the United States, the Indo-Pacific nation. And it's vital for, for all that are dependent on their economic, uh, uh, the economy that runs through this. Um, so we're, so one, we're looking to globalize. Um, and so we were very happy to start ginning, have ginned up support among 11 countries across the globe that rejected and condemned uh, the PRC's unlawful reclamation activities. Um, we are very, and, and so we're trying to globalize and making sure that we have a common understanding of the threats. Got it, thank you. You know, the, as was mentioned, the U.S. and the Philippines has our mutual defense treaty, and we are pursuing more cooperation through the multilateral or additional sites under the, uh, the uh, enhanced defense cooperation uh, arrangement. So uh, I want to ask you, um, Ms. Ford, is the U.S. prepared to back up its uh, mutual defense treaty with military force? And what message would it send to other countries in the region if the U.S. doesn't respond forcefully enough to an uh, event that triggers that treaty? Thank you so much. I think the credibility uh, of our alliances is a bedrock part of U.S. security in the Indo-Pacific region and globally. And that's one reason that the department has been incredibly clear that when it comes to our treaty commitments to the Philippines, we believe an armed attack against Philippine armed forces, public vessels, aircraft, apply to in the South China Sea, that includes the Philippine Coast Guard, and we have said repeatedly and will continue to say that we stand by those commitments absolutely. Thank you. You know, um, we, our delegation also visited the, uh, the Subic Bay, and uh, I just wanted to ask you what lessons uh, did we learn from Subic Bay to ensure that we don't lose um, the critical infrastructure to the uh, CCP in that region? Would you be able to answer that? I'd be happy to chime in here. I actually had the opportunity to visit Subic earlier this year. Um, I think we are very pleased to see um, that an American company uh, is now helping with the administration of the Hanjin shipyard. I walked that shipyard. It's one of the largest shipyards in the world. It is critical strategic infrastructure. And the fact that U.S. companies are cooperating and helping to build jobs and make sure that that uh, strategic area stays in uh, friendly hands I think is incredibly important. Thank you very, very much. At the time we visited, uh, we weren't allowed to name the company name, but I guess it's becoming very clear that it is becoming final, Hanjin? Uh, the, the Hanjin shipyard is yeah. currently being yes. administered by an American company. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, let me now recognize Ranking Member Berra for five minutes of questioning. Great, thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman. I'm gonna yield um, five minutes to Representative Jackson, who I know accompanied you on the, um, the CODEL recently and unfortunately has a time commitment, so I'd love to, to yield him that time. Thank you, very kind of you, Congressman Bear, Congresswoman Kim, Congresswoman, Congressman Barr, thank you for inviting me on the trip. It was fascinating to see the front lines of what's going on there. Specifically, I wanna talk about the looming impending shutdown opportunities or challenges that we're going to face. Uh, first to the uh, Vice Admiral, uh, could you please share with us what was the effect of the 2019 shutdown on the 35-day the shutdown in the military in 2019? In, in 2019, uh, the United States Coast Guard was, was not funded. It was the first time ever uh, that one of the armed services was not funded as a result of a lapse in appropriation. Uh, what, what, we, what we saw is that you had uh, people, Coast Guard people that were deployed in different parts of the world, uh, maybe side by side uh, with their DOD counterparts who were getting paid, but they were not getting paid. And the devastating effects back home to families, uh, as, as, as well as uh, future recruiting and retention uh, still loom. Thank you very much. Um, to our Deputy Secretary Peck, the question I would have is, uh, what's the impact of the uh, diplomatic initiatives that will be impacted by a shutdown? Thank you for that question, Representative Jackson. Um, it would have a huge impact on, way, on how we do business um, in Southeast Asia. Um, as many of you know from visiting the region, showing up matters. 
Um, and I want to foot stomp what DASD Ford said about your engagement um, in the region. And, and we also, in the State Department, hear uh, great things about the, the level of engagement that they have from, from Congress and that it's in a bipartisan way. So, so they see it, our partners and like-minded see it, and they uh, send us kudos for it. So I wanted to really foot stomp what, what DASD Ford had said about, uh, about your engagement. Um, I'll, I'll note that 91 um, rep, uh, representatives or members of Congress visited the region um, in the past year alone. Um, and, and I know that we've seen each other in various uh, ASEAN Committee Washington events together. So, um, so showing up matters and a government shutdown would affect that showing up those personal relationships, especially in matters like the South China Sea, which are pretty sensitive conversations. Will this give a greater opening or opportunities for the Chinese government to strengthen its relations? Um, I would argue that it would fuel the PRC's false narrative that we are not committed, that we are inward looking, that this, is, that this engagement with the Southeast Asian countries are, are just a blip um, and, that, uh, and that ultimately our default position is looking in, inward and looking at domestic issues. So I think that would, that would fuel that false narrative and feed uh, Chinese disinformation on U.S. commitment to the region. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Secretary Ford, I can't call you assistant and all that. You're what I've got to work with, and I'm honored to be here. Um, how will this deal with our readiness, the looming shutdown, and preparedness in the region? Thanks very much. Um, I think the impact of a shutdown would be significant for the Department of Defense. For one thing, there is a tremendous amount of momentum underway that I've already spoken about regarding to what we are doing to strengthen deterrence with our allies and partners. So certainly from a budgetary perspective and how we implement our strategy, there's an enormous impact. We're seeking a 40% increase in Pacific Deterrence Initiative funding. If we have a shutdown, if we have a, of a CR, we can't actually uh, have that funding to implement that strategy. For U.S. forces, for civilians, the work that we undertake in the Department of Defense on a daily basis to oversee the planning of our exercises uh, and everything else, we will not be able to implement anymore, and you will have personnel across the Department of Defense who don't know when they're getting their next paycheck. They're focused on that rather than focusing on all the things that we ought to be doing to maintain deterrence on a daily basis. I thank you all for your service. Thank you, Chairwoman Kim, for inviting me and letting me have this opportunity. Thank you again, Congresswoman Barra and Mr. Barr. I yield back my time. Thank you, Rep. Jackson. It was really good to have you. Uh, now recognize Representative Barr for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Kim, and thank you uh, uh, for your leadership in leading us uh, on the CODEL. It was great to be with uh, Congressman Jackson uh, and uh, Congresswoman Crockett. And I do think, uh, Dr. Pack, to your point, and, and hopefully uh, our uh, State Department diplomats uh, for deployed over there saw the bipartisan uh, uh, unity that we expressed to our partners and allies and counterparts uh, over there. Um, let me uh, start with uh, uh, Admiral uh, Tiangsan because we met when we were in Manila with the, our, our Filipino uh, Coast Guard leaders there, uh, our, uh, and it was apparent uh, in our conversation with the Filipino Coast Guard that they do not currently have enough assets to adequately confront the well-funded uh, uh, Chinese uh, Coast Guard uh, and gray zone operations. Um, and they asked for help, and they specifically asked for more uh, more assets uh, and ships. How, how, how is the United States Coast Guard working with the Filipinos to expand the capabilities of their Coast Guard? Do we have enough assets, uh, uh, cutters and, and whatnot, that could be deployed to the South China Sea to assist in those law enforcement operations? We, we have a very strong relationship, as you, as you observed, with the Philippine Coast Guard. In fact, the Philippine Coast Guard uh, we have our largest security sector assistance program with them. Uh, in fact, when you talk assets, uh, we, through the interagency partnerships, built an entire training center to help them with operations as well as maintenance of the vessels that they do have uh, that they are in the ribbon cutting was just in the last uh, couple of weeks for that. We have helped them grow their Coast Guard from 5,000 to their goal of about 35,000. They're still working on that, but they're well into that right now. And we have assigned a maritime advisor to them 
uh, to help along that growth uh, projection. In addition to that, we do work with them uh, with our ships. In fact, just recently we had our first trilateral, trilateral underway exercise between Japan Coast Guard, Philippine Coast Guard, and U.S. Coast Guard. Now, you all are doing a great job in, um, to uh, 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 Deputy Assistant Secretary Pack. Um, you did note in your testimony about how um, we are doing, uh, and one of the main objectives uh, is maritime capacity building programs for the region's maritime law enforcement agencies and militaries, but the Phil Filipino Coast Guard is specifically asking for more ships. Uh, is that included in your, in your plans, is assistance to the Filipino Coast Guard, Navy and Coast Guard? Um, and, and thank they you. They can't confront the PLN with what they've got, is what they're telling us. Right. Um, the Admiral has mentioned the Japan relationship and, and, and how we're, and that's part of our efforts to, to knit together groupings and of, of like-minded countries together. Um, and so uh, I just uh, hosted in July a, a maritime dialogue with the Philippines, and they brought a, a sizable contingent to talk about these and other issues. And part of the State Department's um, goals there is to make sure that we're consulting frequently and, and in depth to talk about exactly what the, Fil uh, what the Philippines need, um, Coast, Guard, uh, Coast Guard capabilities and otherwise. That's great. And I'm running out of time, so my, my last two questions are to um, uh, Deputy S Assistant Secretary uh, Ford. Um, the Sierra N N Madre is not, it's, it's falling apart. It's not a permanent solution to the second Thomas Shoal issue. Um, as Chair Kim po uh, pointed out, we were, uh, you know, we uh, flew over in a P-8 over, over the uh, Chinese Coast Guard vessel there that's right off of the shore. They clearly want it. They want to militarize that just like they've done with uh, Fiery Reef and Mischief Reef and all these others. Um, what, what is the, what is the long-term plan to help the Filipinos uh, defend their exclusive economic zone uh, beyond uh, a temporary Sierra uh, Madre situation there? And then last question, uh, the EDCA sites in the Philippines. Um, this is a, a big, important development. What are we going to do at those EDCA sites? What does Indo-PACOM want? And why not make, um, and I know we, we met with uh, Ambassador Carlson, and I know there's some internal diplomatic uh, challenges, but why not make Subic an EDCA site, and um, can we not work with the Filipino government to uh, reestablish a U.S. naval presence beyond just the shipbuilding activity there at Subic? Thanks very much, Representative. Um, you know, we are in regular conversations with our Philippine allies about how we help them modernize their capabilities. And so we're doing a number of things. We are in the process of negotiating a multi-year security sector assistance roadmap that will enable us to bring more maritime capability more quickly to them. We have committed to negotiate a JASOMIA by the end of this year that will enhance our information and intelligence sharing that enables them to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, and we recently concluded defense guidelines that talk about how we will actually enhance our operational planning to enable them to be more effective in what they do on the water and in the air in the South China Sea. When it comes to EDCA, um, we are really thrilled how EDCA is moving forward. The department has already allocated over $100 million for infrastructure investments that you'll continue to see over the next few years coming online. In response to your question about Subic, what I would say is, Anything that is designated as an EDCA site is done in partnership and in coordination with the Philippines and only when the Philippines is looking uh, for that EDCA designation. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize oh, your time's up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to recognize Ranking Member Barra for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Dash Ford. You know, in your opening comments, you referenced um, UNCLOS, the law of the sea, um, which uh, on our side of Congress, we don't get a chance to ratify it, but obviously um, it has not been ratified um, by the, the, the Senate. Um, and the, the PRC uses that sometimes against us when you know, we try to say, you know, there's a ruling. From your perspective, um, how important is it that that we push? And I've talked to you know um, you know other colleagues like Congressman Courtney and, and others that we really ought to make a push to, to ratify that and it would strengthen our hands um, in upholding the the rule of law, particularly in the South China Sea. Thanks very much. Um, 
and, and I'm sure the Admiral has uh, thoughts here as well, I would say it's incredibly important. You will hear no one speak more loudly um, than the Department of Defense and the U.S. Navy um, about how much uh, upholding UNCLOS matters um, and that we think ratification is important. The reality is the U.S. Navy continues to operate um, in accordance with UNCLOS uh, everywhere we go, but operationally maintaining um, the freedoms that we are allowed under UNCLOS is incredibly important. It is only one leg of the stool, though, and seeing that legal recognition as well, it, we think it matters a lot. Right, so we already hold ourselves to that standard. Um, so I, if my colleagues um, over on the other side of Congress are watching, um, I would hope the Senate would take that up and you know, it would be important. Um, Vice Admiral, if you want to add anything to that, but I'd also, you know, um, Congressman Barr touched on, you know, as I've traveled around the region, obviously, you know, Vietnam, Philippines, others would love additional Coast Guard assets and, and had her, uh, I'm, you know, Mexico would love, love additional help as well. Knowing we've got limitations, knowing that we have transferred some, some assets there, knowing that we're doing some joint training and maritime dom domain awareness, and that the Coast Guard will really be uh, vitally important um, in protecting territorial sovereignty um, and the maritime governance mission in that region. What are some things that we should be thinking about from the congressional side? Just to add to that piece, uh, I mentioned earlier our value proposition is maritime governance. And exactly as uh, Dasty Ford was saying, uh, we, we live by the rule of law all the time. Uh, we, we agree to the international, uh, internationally accepted norms and standards. Uh, we follow professional maritime behaviors everywhere we go, without a, without a doubt. That is, that is part of maritime governance. Uh, to, your, to your points about, uh, uh, I'm going to say, excess defense articles in many ways. So as, as you were tracking, I believe, in Vietnam, we've provided uh, two uh, high endurance cutters, so our 378-foot ships. There's a third one that could be there. Uh, through uh, help with the interagency partners, we provided 25 response boats also to the Vietnam uh, Coast Guard, and we have a maritime advisor there as well. So are we, we have a footprint in the Philippines I described earlier, uh, as well as uh, in Vietnam. The key for us uh, is right now we are episodic in our presence. What we need to be is a little bit more persistent in our presence. Uh, we thank the administration and Congress for this Indo-Pacific support cutter that I hope to receive here very soon uh, in the winter time frame and then get it operational uh, in the early spring, probably in the Oceania region first. A second one of those would do great wonders in different parts of the Indo-Pacific, uh, as well as on our unfunded priorities list that has been forwarded up to Congress. We have four fast response cutters that allow us to provide more presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, das Pocker, Vice Admiral, um, you, you also talk about stretching our resources by working with our, our partners and, and, and allies, whether that's Australians, New Zealand, Japan, others. Could you just, in the, the brief time I have left, touch on the importance and, and what our strategy is in terms of kind of that, that coalition building? Sure. Uh, we work through ASEAN, as you know, um, to make sure that ASEAN itself as an organization also uh, calls out uh, PRC's activities in the South China Sea. You'll note in the U.S. ASEAN Summit statement in which uh, the Vice President uh, participated, there was a strong statement uh, about the South China Sea. Uh, we also work through AUKUS. We work through e dialogues with the EU. We work through the Japan, Philippines, U.S. relationship. In the Camp David, uh, the unprecedented, unprecedented Camp David uh, Summit with Korea and Japan, um, South China Sea was a, was a key part of that, and, and the three countries' uh, uh, prioritization of Southeast Asia and to um, make that, that air, uh, uh, part of the world um, more <coughs> resilient. Um, and so there are a variety of groupings and ways and dialogue mechanisms, and that's not to mention the, the bilateral mechanisms as well. I'll yield back. You, the gentleman's time's up. Now I recognize Representative Sherman for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I think the meetings uh, with high Chinese officials make a lot of sense. Ronald Reagan, whose uh, mem uh, memory and uh, administration was commemorated yesterday at the Republican debate, of course, met with Khrushchev, uh, Gorbachev, rather, at a time when uh, the Soviet Union had many thousands of uh, nuclear weapons aimed at the United States, far more than China has. 
Um, we are not approaching this from a position of strength. The trade deficit is enormous. Every dollar we ship to China empowers them and weakens us. In addition, we provide a capital gains allowance, an incentive at the cost of the U.S. Treasury for those who invest in Chinese stocks. The purpose of the capital gains allowance is to encourage investment to build an economy. You can argue that it's a good investment in the American economy when we invest in American stocks. Why do we provide that? And I look forward to perhaps having some co-sponsors for a bill to say no capital gains allowance for investment in Chinese stocks. And finally, um, uh, our, I think our military is strong, but this shutdown is making us weaker both militarily and, uh, and in terms of uh, diplomacy as well. We look like the Keystone Cops. Uh, the, uh, those uh, Asian leaders who have studied history will note that empires fall and great nations fall when they're unable to pay their troops on time. Um, we're doing that to ourselves. Um, now, the... Uh, um, we have, up until this administration, had a deliberately ambiguous position as to uh, how would we react militarily if Taiwan were blockaded or invaded. Uh, uh, Dr. Pack, uh, is it now clear that uh, the Biden administration would respond militarily in the case of uh, such an, uh, a military attack on Taiwan? Thank you, Representative Sherman. Um, I just wanted to just touch um, on the I'm sorry, I have limited time. Sure. Can you say yes uh, or no? Yes. Um, for over four decades, um, we have abided by our One China policy um, that's been guided by the Taiwan Relations Act. Is it our policy Act. to respond militarily if Taiwan is invaded? Well, yes, we will make, no the United States will make available um, Taiwan defense articles and services necessary um, so to enable not, it to maintain so sufficient self-defense capability. Our response may not include uh, putting American uh, lives at risk. Um, I, you know, I, I don't really want to go into hypotheticals. Well, I um, thought the I thought Biden said we will defend Taiwan. Uh, are you saying that it, that's just and his we do policy, so in multiple, in multiple in multiple in well, multiple ways in Taiwan terms of increasing means, Taiwan's okay. international space? Um, Taiwan has a lot to offer. Its democratic so governance, its economy. We continue to be ambiguous as to whether that would involve deployment of American troops. Um, we want. We continue to assert and and make sure that we have a peaceful resolution of the cross strait. Um, well, obviously, uh, everybody issues. wants peace. I'm asking the more difficult question: How do we respond if China wages war, and you're not willing to answer or even tell me that you want to be ambiguous? Um, <laughs> There's well, nothing I, more ambiguous than refusing to tell me whether you're going to be ambiguous. Um, I think our policy speaks for itself, and, and I won't put words into the <laughs> what president's mouth. What you're saying is that I'm I won't stupid put for asking the, the president's question because mouth, the but, answer is obvious. But for obvious. four decades, we believe that our oh, the so One our China po policy our, has, okay. I'm, I'm has gonna, been successful in maintaining go, cross strait um, stability. Well, what's been successful is that the Chinese military hasn't been powerful enough to invade Taiwan. They're getting closer every day. Um, uh, Forty years ago, China couldn't have invaded Taiwan. Um, I would point out that we uh, continue, we, we were an area where we should not be ambiguous, is we should make it clear that if Taiwan is invaded or blockaded, that ends most favored nation status for China. Not because I want to see that happen, but because that's the way to put uh, China on notice with something other than, uh, than uh, ambiguity. Now, I know at the State Department, uh, uh, a large percentage of your people will be furloughed if uh, we have a government shutdown. Uh, Admiral, uh, do your people get paid September 30th? And uh, I assume they have to keep uh, working. Uh, uh, when is their first interrupted paycheck? The first interrupted paycheck would come at, at the fiscal at the change of the fiscal year. Uh, that's about 38,000 active duty members. So they get paid September. Do they get a check September 30th and have to wait for the next one? When's the next one? It would be in the on the 15th, halfway through 15th. the month. 15th. So if we shut down the government. Your people have to work. They don't get paid. That may apply to the military, or maybe we would pass a military uh, defense bill. What would that do to the morale in the Coast Guard uh, if uh, they not have to work and they don't get paid? They, we, we will continue to focus on, on those what missions that are national defense. What would it do to morale, defense. sir? Uh, Morale-wise, uh, as experienced in 2019, it is hard. 
and the gentleman's impairs time's American up. security. I yield back. Thank you. Let me now recognize Representative Moylan for your questioning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the panel members here today for allowing me to wave in for this hearing. I appreciate the chance to hear from the witnesses, panels, and, and a chance to speak about the importance of working counter China, uh, to counter China's continued illegal actions in the South China Sea uh, at the and the Pacific at large. Uh, it is essential that we in Washington show our allies in the Pacific that we do not accept rogue nations flaunting their disrespect for international borders and instead work with our regional allies to ensure a safe and secure Pacific. Over $3.4 trillion of in trade pass through the South China Sea every year. If we continue to appease China and allow them to build artificial reefs throughout the region, it is only going to be a matter of time before they seek to disrupt this crucial trade corridor. Last month, I wrote an op-ed uh, uh, that was published in The Hill speaking on this very issue. Madam Chair, I, I ask unanimous consent that the op-ed titled The U.S. Must Send a Strong Message in the Face of China's Harassment of the Philippines to be entered into record. Without objection. Uh, this this op-ed uh, I called for the increase of joint patrols with our regional allies and inclusion of the Philippines and future Quad Plus as well. Uh, my my first question for Assistant Secretaries Pack and Ford, uh, do you think we should seek to include the Philippines in future Quad Plus discussions? And when will we begin to seek more bi and multilateral arrangements in the Indo-Pacific involving one of our closest regional allies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. Um, those are great questions. I'm really thrilled to hear you advocating for joint patrols, um, which, as I mentioned, is something that we just engaged in with the Philippines. Um, I know in the recent uh, engagement between the Philippines and Australia, this is conversations uh, that they're having as well. So from our perspective, we are strongly supportive of not just bilateral patrols, but exploring opportunities for multilateral patrols with the Philippines and with other partners as well. When it comes to um, the Quad or other kinds of minilateral settings, what I would say is over the last year, we inaugurated a new US-Japan-Philippines defense dialogue. So we are looking trilaterally along with other interagency partners at what more we can do to network the Philippines with our partners. The Secretary also convened the first ever meeting of US, Japan, Australia, and Philippine defense ministers. So we have been networking the Philippines into many of our other alliances much more proactively. It's a central part of our strategy. And from State Department's perspective, um, in addition to working with DOD on all of those uh, on those uh, groupings, um, we've worked very hard to rally support for the Philippines and the Philippines' um, ability to um, lawfully um, exercise, operate, fly in their uh, in in their region. Um, and so we've been very focused on making sure that the Philippines have the have the support, not just of the United States, but on a global scale. I appreciate all that uh, working together and the networking, but I think the quad would also be in addition to that that would be very helpful. But thank you, thank you for your statements. Uh, Vice, uh, Vice Admiral, uh, last week the Chinese Coast Guard illegally laid a thousand foot long barrier to block uh, Scarabog uh, Skull, uh, which is well within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Nonetheless, China claims that the school belongs to them thanks, to, uh, thanks in part to their 10 dash line map. Uh, which is an increase in maritime area from the previous nine dash line. Uh, that included contested areas that extended, extends well beyond international agreed upon borders, both on land and sea. This follows other uh, prerogative actions by the Chinese Coast Guard in, in August when they attempted to interrupt routine resupply of Philippine base in Second to Moscow. These actions are totally illegal under the current international law and, and fly in the face of the 2016 disc discussion by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in Hague. Qu our question is, what more can our Coast Guard do to help support our allies as they attempt to deal with these constant assaults on their sovereignty? If asked by the Philippine Coast Guard, would the U.S. Coast Guard be inclined in joining the, our allies to deter bad faith action by the CCP? Vice Admiral. We will, we will continue to help uh, build their capacity and capability to, to deter and defend their sovereign rights. Uh, we will continue to do, uh, uh, share with them our tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures to make sure that they are ready for those types of events. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we 
we have a consensus that we're going to go for a second round of questioning. So let me ask a couple questions very quickly. Uh, you know, when we were out in the region, we uh, spoke to our allies and we talked a lot about the dangerous uh, PRC behavior in South China Sea. And we did the flyover, as was mentioned, and we were actually witnessing the uh, China's, um, the Chinese military, uh, you know, conducting in an unprofessional and unsafe ways, uh, radioing in and asking questions like, how many of us are there? Why are we there? That type of thing. So we want to know uh, what is the contingency plan if there is an accident and could an incident spark a conflict there? Um, and when we were talking to the Philippine Coast Guard, um, and our counterparts with the Philippine, uh, you know, the officials, they were talking about, yeah, you know, there is a, the hotline. The problem is they don't even pick up the hotline. Um, so how confident are we that they are going to pick up since they have shown not to be responsive to other, uh, like, flesh points in our relationship, such as when we had the spy balloon incident flying over our continent. So what is our plan? Great. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, we share your concern about the unsafe uh, PRC operational behavior that we've seen, not just in the South China Sea, to be honest with you, through the Taiwan Strait across the Indo-Pacific region. The department, the secretary, have spoken out on this repeatedly, uh, and you are exactly right. Uh, unplanned incidents have real escalatory potential, um, and that's something that deeply concerns us. It is why we have continued to say that we believe that uh, communication channels between the United States and the PRC, defense and military channels, is incredibly important, um, and, and we are trying to keep that channel of communication open so that we can avoid those kinds of unplanned incidents. The um, problem is they don't pick up those lines. It, so it, it certainly is a problem. Hard. We certainly can continue to say as much as possible that, that, that that needs to be in place. And other than that, we do everything possible to closely coordinate with our allies, like the Philippines, to make sure that we're prepared for any potential crises. You know, what would we need to establish that, um, you know, with our PRC and what actions would we need to see from PRC to actually avoid miscalculation and accidental escalation? I think the, the Admiral can chime in here as well, but what I would say is we, there are well known, um, especially for uh, naval vessels, um, we have a code for unplanned encounters at sea. Uh, there are clear rules that define what safe operational behavior looks like in the maritime domain. China has said in the past that it is willing uh, and has signed up to abide by those. It is not. Um, so how to behave safely is not actually that complicated. Um, it's simply that you actually need to stand by what you've said you'll do. Well, thank you. I'm going to um, turn it over to Ranking Member Barra for your questions. Great, thank you. Um, this has been a, a, a great hearing and, and certainly a super important topic. We talked a lot about the, the Philippines and Vietnam. I'd love to give um, any of the witnesses an opportunity to talk about um, what we might be seeing around Indonesia, around the Natunas, and, and, and so forth, and, and give their perspective on, on that, maybe starting with Bass Ford. Sure, thank you so much. Indonesia is a critically important partner for us. Um, the Secretary has seen Minister Prabowo, his counterpart, twice this past year already. I expect we will again. Um, certainly in every conversation that we have with our Indonesian partners, maritime security is an important part of what we talk about. It's one reason why as a department we have been working with Indonesia to provide them with ISR, air, maritime capabilities. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, we have been actively working with them to identify new and emerging capabilities that also may help them police their EEZs more effectively. Over 17,000 islands, a tremendous amount of water that they have to police. So this is something we're very focused on with them. Great. Bi Vice Admiral, if you'd like to add anything from the Coast Guard perspective. I, I would just, uh, I would uh, totally agree with uh, Das Ford in, in that piece. Maritime domain awareness is huge uh, to there. Uh, particularly because of uh, all of those islands that, that were just discussed. Great, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, when I'm gonna have to, have to leave, but again, my deep appreciation to the, the witnesses here, to 
to you for holding the, this hearing. And again, I think the scenario where we can work in a bipartisan, bicameral <laughs> way with the administration, and again, applaud the, the, the strong work of the will administration. Will the gentleman yield his time? Yeah, of course. Good. Thank you. I want to resume with Dr. Pack. Um, back in uh, last year, the president appeared on uh, 60 Minutes. And uh, I realize you don't, you know, you work with the president, for the president you have, not the president you might wish we had. And he made it, he said, and they, they uh, wanted to clarify he clarified that, and this is a Reuters story, and I'll ask uh, unanimous consent to put this Reuters article of September 19, 2022 in the record. In that story, the, uh, the president was asked whether we would commit American men and women to, f uh, uh, un uh, to fight if... Um, uh, Taiwan were invaded, and he said yes. Uh, are you saying that the president's words are not the words of uh, administration policy? Thank you, Representative Sherman. Um, I will. I'm not going to interpret the president's statements. What what well, we what, do what is from, our from our, is our policy an what unambiguous we do from commitment of American forces to fight uh, uh, against an invasion of Taiwan? Is our policy? the policy we had uh, uh, under prior administrations where we were intentionally ambiguous, or you simply don't know the policy? Um, what, from, from, our, from State Department's perspective, um, and, I, and I'm not going to interpret, uh, I think the President speaks for, for, for um, I, I'll let his words um, stand. I know the President speaks but for I, himself. But Does I he just, speak for the administration? I want to say that what we're doing very intensely is to make sure that there is no conflict okay, so in the Taiwan okay. Strait. We, we both given want peace. That I'm asking you a question. How do we react if there's an invasion? And your response is, well, we don't want an invasion. Well, I think That's I, don't, not a response. I don't want That's to go into the hypotheticals of how that answer, might happen. Just say you refuse to answer. Don't I'm pretend afraid I, to answer. I can't answer that right now. Okay. But we can so certainly get back to you on the that. The president makes statements. The State Department may or may not decide that that is our policy. Um, uh, Ms. Ford, we have a, poli a situation where it appears to be our policy that the Defense Department's uh, 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 men and women would be deployed to defend Taiwan. But we don't have an explicit policy to end MFN for China. If we're fighting, what r would the effect on morale be if American uh, Marines and troops and sailors are dying fighting the Chinese on the one hand, but Walmart is Im importing things from China and making big profits on the same day? W would that have a good effect on American morale? Should we ask our troops to die while our corporations make money and our consumers buy Chinese goods? Would that make sense? I can't tell you what the uh, effect uh, specifically of most favored nation status or, or not would be. I'm I would not say the Department of nation status. Defense I'm asking takes if very seriously the morale of our troops, the well-being of our troops. We never want to see them in harm's way. I'm and I think that's you what why effect it would have on our troops if corporations are making billions, importing goods from China on the same day when our Marines and sailors are dying in the Taiwan Straits. Would that have an effect on morale? Yes or no, or you don't know. Sir, my job is to make sure they're never in harm's way, and that's why we're focused on this. So we don't need to have a hearing about how to react if, if Taiwan is invaded because we just hope that it won't happen. I don't think we hope. I think we're we laser pray. focused on deterrence. Work. And there are a number of things we're doing to enhance our posture and capabilities to make sure that deterrence remains strong. And are you 100 percent sure that those efforts will be successful? I am very confident that deterrence is strong today, and we are doing what yeah, we need to do to make sure you're not 100 percent sure that the deterrence will be successful, and you refuse to respond how we will react if the deterrence is unsuccessful. The most important part of deterrence is to is to identify for the Chinese what our response would be, and you won't even tell me that it's illogical and harmful to morale to make billions uh, in trade on the same day when our troops are dying uh, in the in the Taiwan Straits. It sounds like, other than telling me that you, uh, that you don't want Taiwan invaded, you don't want to answer any questions. And that's fine if you would just be honest enough to say you don't want to answer any questions. 
um, although why you would come here and testify is 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 up in the air. Um, the, the, Admiral, I do have one question for you, and this is on the dovish side. Um, we have the right to sail our military ships right up to the 12 miles off the coast of China, and we do it from time to time. Does China operate with significant naval force 12, 13 miles off the U.S. coast on a regular basis? I, I, do not, I haven't come across any um, incursions of that to our territorial seas. But we do it to them. Thank I you. The back. gentleman's time's up. Let me now recognize Representative Barr for your questions. I, I, th I think my colleague, uh, Mr. Sherman, does m make a good point that Congress uh, needs to maybe uh, make a, a, a policy decision here with respect to the economic ramifications of a cross strait invasion. And we could clarify what the policy of the United States would be in that case. And I'd, I'd, I'd offer to work with the gentleman on that, uh, including the most favored nation suggestion and, and, and certainly a powerful sanctions uh, in, in that case, and, and to telegraph that, frankly, uh, to Beijing, that uh, there will be repercussions and it will, it will be very painful. Um, let me go back to uh, Dr. Pack uh, on the 9-dash line, 10-dash line um, issue. I know that, and I applaud the administration's policy of pr trying to bring more international consensus on this question uh, that really is is, is n it should not be a subject to debate given the UN Tribunal's t uh, 2016 unanimous determination that, uh, that this is a violation of, of international law. But what can we do with the United Nations and, uh, and these uh, allies and partners to delegitimize uh, China's claims uh, on the Nine Dash Line? How can we amplify the international court ruling from the UN? I'll give you one suggestion from our Filipino partners, which was to have a resolution in Congress uh, uh, re re referring to uh, this body of water as the West Philippine Sea as opposed to the South China Sea. Now, I know Vietnam has some claims there which could complicate matters, but um, what, is the, what is the State Department's position on a, a renaming of that as the West Philippine Sea? I don't have a, a, a technical answer to that, um, Representative Barr, but over and over again, we foot stomp this on the, two th on, the, on the legally binding nature of the 2016 award. We do that in bilaterally with the PRC, and we do it in multilateral fora when the PRC is also in that room, um, and that's echoed by all of our uh, like-minded allies and partners. Xi Jinping lied to President Obama. He lied to President Obama. I can say it. Maybe you can't, but that's what he did. Um, and so, and, and you will hear us say that loud and clear from the hilltops um, and the mountaintops about the about the the um, uh, the 2016 award being legally binding on all parties. As you know from from your trips and your and your conversations, the PRC has been trying to erode that and trying to delegitimize uh, that 2016 ruling. But we will continue to uh, keep yelling it from the mountaintops keep that this is legally binding. Keep it up. Thank you. Keep it up. And to uh, Das Ford, um, what are the solutions to pushing back and preventing further PRC buildup and militarization of the reefs uh, in the South China Sea or West Philippine Sea? Um, and, and the reason I say that is, is um, you know, it, it's uh, the, the militarized Bradley Island outposts are a threat to U.S. forces in the, in the Taiwan scenario. So preventing further militarization or artificial island building is important for the Taiwan scenario for U.S. forces um, moving in that, that 440 nautical miles north. But uh, to have, have China on the south end of, of, uh, of that, but what, what do we need to do to eject the Chinese or at least limit further militarization? I think that's really important for the Defense Department. Thank you. I agree with you very much, Representative. So what I would say is the first thing that we need to do and are doing is to bring more awareness and transparency about what the PLA is actually doing in the South China Sea, including on its outposts. That, so that's one reason for us. We are very focused on information sharing, and we are working with allies and partners to make sure that it is more publicly known what is taking place in the yeah, South let, China Sea. And let's, let's, let's emphasize your testimony. Uh, uh, advanced anti-ship cruise missiles, long-range surface-to-air missile systems, J-20 stealth fighter jets, laser and jamming equipment, military radar and signals intelligence capabilities. 
not just in the South China Sea, in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. This is preparing for war. You, that, this, they don't do this other, other than that purpose, and that's what the American people need to understand there. Um, I've, I've, I'm running out of time, uh, but let me just ask one final question um, uh, uh, to Dr. Pak, and I promised uh, the Foreign Minister of Indonesia uh, Marsudi that I would communicate back to Secretary Blinken on this and, and to the State Department. The, the Indonesian government was very disappointed that uh, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris was dispatched as opposed to the President when he was right there at the G20 and went to Vietnam. Yes, a partner, but a communist country. They are the fourth largest uh, population country in the world and a democracy. If we want to send a signal that Indonesia is our friend, we need the president there. Thank you. Um, the vice president attended, and she was and uh, she was hugely successful. Um, we had uh, she had great meetings with Waisili. She had great meetings with Indonesian officials. As you might be tracking, the the uh, president Jokowi um, will be in Washington um, sometime in November, um, and so we look forward to welcoming um, welcoming the Indonesian government. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. I want to thank all the witnesses for your valuable testimony and uh, engaging with our members and asking, I mean, answering tough questions too. At times, pretty feisty engagement. Thank you so much. The members of the committee uh, may have some additional questions uh, for the witnesses, and in that case, we ask you to submit those answers in writing. And let me now recognize myself some uh, closing remarks. You know, as the witnesses noted, as you noted, uh, the PRC is ramping up uh, their aggression and military footprint in the South China Sea. And uh, since those waters are of critical importance to global shipping, the U.S. national security, and our commitment to Indo-Pacific, the U.S. must, bond, must respond uh, to that aggression. And from each of the countries that we visited in August, I, had to, I heard the same thing. Uh, that the PRC is doing this because they can. And they have received little or no pushback. And every single one of the people that we met, they said that. And it is thus critical that the U.S. respond to every single act of aggression by the PRC in the South China Sea. In Indonesia, I was glad to give remark at uh, Ambassador Sung Kim's uh, he hosted a, a, a reception for Super Garuda Shield uh, the day after we had that reception. They were doing the multilateral exercises. And I spoke with the servicemen and women from our allies and partners around the world that were gathered. I believe there were 19 nations uh, present. And I saw the energy and the commitment to protecting our shared interests in the region. And so I hope we can work together to get these folks uh, the capabilities, the training, and the support they need to protect those shared interests. And I echo uh, Dr. Park's uh, comments about the U.S.'s need to show up in the region. Uh, as Congressman Barr mentioned, when we were in Indonesia, we met with a foreign minister, and um, she clearly told us, I mean, she didn't mince her words. She told us how disappointed she was that uh, President Biden was not able to as attend the ASEAN summit, where we uh, tried to explain that there was some, you know, scheduling conflict, and Vice President uh, was coming, but it was very, very apparent that the disappointment was not lost um, on them. And while I support the uh, the engagement with Vietnam, it's important, but it is more important that we show up and court democracies in the region too, and obviously uh, the largest democracy in Indonesia that it is. That's why it was important for me to ensure uh, that my first CODEL as chairwoman of this Indo-Pacific subcommittee was to visit with our two key allies, Thailand, Philippines, and of course the, the largest democracy in Southeast Asia, Indonesia. So our trip was a show of commitment and reassurance, and we demonstrated bipartisan congressional support for those important relationships. And lastly, many Americans may be wondering why we're talking about South China Sea today. 
Yet we rely on the South China Sea for much of our shipping, including to and from the four of our top 10 trading partners, and it is a uh, bellwether for our U.S. commitment to the region. So I say if we let China aggressively bully its way through the South China Sea, we could see large-scale supply chain disruptions and a complete breakdown of the rules-based international order. And that will affect every American who enjoys the level of commerce and the freedom that we enjoy today. So let me once again repeat how grateful we are for your time spending your afternoon with us answering our questions. And I look forward to continuing our work together with each and every one of you on this very, very important issue. So, Pursuant to committee rules, all members may have five additional days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitations. So without objection, the committee now stands adjourned.